Hello, and welcome to Strategic Alternatives, the RBC M&A podcast. In each episode, we explore the trends shaping tomorrow's global mergers and acquisitions landscape. I'm Vito Sperduto, co-head of Global M&A. Recently, I had the opportunity to sit down with my colleagues, Larry Grafstein, Deputy Chairman of Global Investment Banking, and Ben Mandel, Head of Canadian M&A, and we discussed our outlook for 2023. In this three-part series, we explore topics impacting dealmaking in these disrupted times, including what the new normal for M&A will look like and how the rise of activism and the shifting regulatory landscape may impact boardroom decisions next year and beyond. Vito, M&A activity faced some headwinds in 2022. How do you think volatility impacted the volume overall? And how would you compare it to what we saw in previous years? Well, Larry and, and Ben, I would tell you, it, obviously, it's been an incredible roller coaster ride. If I think about when volume really started to kick off, I mean, we've been on a, a nonstop M&A train since the second half of 2020. And we still saw that increased volume in the first half of 21, and then just the third quarter shut down. I think it's the first time that we've seen that slow of an activity level. And I think a lot of it's just been uncertainty in the markets. Geopolitical instability, certainly we're starting to feel the impact of the Ukraine crisis. I think there's concerns around inflation that have crept into the views from different corporates. And we're also seeing just the forward uncertainty has slowed down the pace of M&A right now. Now, if we look at the volume that where we're going to end up the year uh, in terms of 22, it still will be a, a relatively strong year if you compare it to the five years pre-COVID, so 2015 to 2019. But I think that what we're going to see is that there will be pent-up demand built up because there's a lot of transactions that are preparing to come to market, assets that are being prepared for sale that we're just waiting for a window to open. And so I'm not sure if it's going to be the same level of volume we saw when the window opened post the beginning of COVID, but it will be something strong and noticeable once it opens up. Yeah, I think we can all agree we saw a marked deceleration in the second half of the year, but Vito makes an excellent point. 2022 is still, by most standards, a very strong year for M&A volume. But given that the slowdown was back end loaded, I think we're a little more cautious going into the first part of 2023. Yeah, I'd agree with all that. We're seeing a similar trend in Canadian activity where overall, same trend as global, where a market slowdown in 2021, and really you saw a deceleration in a quarter over quarter pattern. Where you saw a bit of a difference in Canada is we like to look at things on a Canadian target basis. So activity for Canadian-based companies, and that saw the same experience as global activity. The difference was Canadian outbound activity, so Brookfield, Canadian pension plans doing, doing M&A abroad, picked up and was actually probably going to end up up on the year, which is a bit of a difference compared to the global theme. Yeah, look, I think we're certainly seeing, I mean, when you think about cross-border activity, as we look at sort of North America to Europe or to Asia, you would have thought there'd be a stronger level of activity just given the strength of the currency, the dollar, as an example. But I think regulatory concerns, some of that volatility that we're seeing creeping in there, those are things that are tempering the volume. And so I don't think we've seen it at a level that we would have expected uh, right now. And so I'm still trying to figure out when that comes back. And I think with some stability, you know, the question is, do companies focus more on their home markets or do they start pursuing some of those transactions that they were considering abroad? Yeah, it's so interrelated with the issue of confidence. And we'll talk about confidence in the M&A cycle, but there's a real hope on the part of CEOs, private equity investors, that the confidence can be restored and stabilized. People are almost anxious for that turn to happen. But as we sit here late in 2022, uh, it hasn't happened, and part of that is perhaps understandable given that the Fed has moved into a tightening cycle. And that was previewed, it was telegraphed. I think uh, everybody was taken a bit by surprise uh, on the inflation front and clearly on the geopolitical front. So the compounding factor has led to a, a, a bit of concern compared to certainly where we were 12 months ago. Now. As we'll talk about later, I think there's been pockets where we've continued to see strength of activity, 
right? So if you're sitting there and you're flush with cash, whether you're a corporate or you're a sponsor, and I mean, we've seen significant funds that have been raised, especially for technology-focused endeavors, and those spaces have been very active. I think the corporates that are sitting on a, a ample cash right now are taking a look around and seeing there's, if there's opportunities. But at the end of the day, as you mentioned, confidence, I still think it's when the board is in that room with the C-suite and they're trying to make a decision, if there's a lack of confidence in the forward outlook, not only in their business or in the market or their industry, it's very hard to pull the trigger on a transaction. We always you know, take a very close look at the measure of CEO confidence. And uh, I read a lot of what the conference board produces. And the last couple of quarters, in the third quarter and fourth quarter of 22, we've seen the lowest levels since the 08 credit crisis. And so what does that mean? I think the view of where they expect their businesses to be in six months' time is uncertain. It's negative, potentially. And as a result, you're not seeing transaction volume. And if you match that up with quarterly M&A volumes, it coincides with the lowest M&A volumes that we've seen in quite some time, uh, certainly in the third quarter. And I would tell you, the fourth quarter is going to be better than what we saw in the, in the third quarter, but it's still going to be challenged. Um, and we, we are certainly seeing that in our own pipelines. I mean, uh, I think we've gotten a number of significant mandates where we are thinking about what's the right window to approach the market right now. But until our clients feel comfortable, and then also, if you think about if you're selling an asset, making sure buyers are prepared to do a transaction. And until we see that, I think it's, it, we're, it's gonna be a, a slower market. So what I think is so interesting about this is, we all know confidence is a huge driver of M&A activity. And during COVID, you would have thought there'd be a real decline in confidence. But I think because of government support and the way that companies and yeah. societies reacted, you actually saw the ability for corporates and sponsors to sort of look through the pandemic experience and have confidence in the ability to drive transactions. And as you spoke about, we saw record levels of M&A activity in 2021. I think now that's all coming off. So that's fueled a lot of the inflation we're seeing. As you spoke about, we're seeing a decline in confidence levels. And so I think you're going to start to see a real a real shift in not all boats are rising in high tide of, of government support and the ability to look through the pandemic. And there's going to be more industry-specific issues that companies are facing that's going to impact M&A levels. Some of uh, pockets of speculation have really been flushed out by the environment. So uh, SPACs, which were a big factor in M&A in 2021, effectively were frozen as a factor in 2022. And I don't think any of us expect that they'll come back to the same level in, in 2023. Also, crypto you know, was, a, was a major development of the past few years, and the recent uh, issues with crypto space have probably reduced the intensity of speculation in those areas. So we see some of the things that are perhaps expected when we see the Fed go into a tightening phase. Um, and some of the excesses uh, that resulted from that very strong reaction in COVID are being tempered. And, and I think that's generally healthy. Yeah. No, I mean, Larry, you mentioned SPACs. I mean, if you take them out of the equation, I mean, overall M&A volumes are off globally this year, probably about 34, 35%. Excluding SPACs, it's off about 29%, let's say. There are a large amount of SPACs that are going to expire in the first quarter of 23. And you're gonna see that market, I think what, what we're already seeing in that market is some solidifying of where some normal uh, will be on a go forward basis. You're seeing smaller transaction sizes, you're seeing them for more established companies. Certainly it's being done by some companies that are seeing that as an avenue to either get higher proceeds than you'd be able to get through an IPO, maybe shorten the time frame, but what you are seeing is that the merger partners for SPACs are companies that would be able to get public otherwise versus some of the speculative businesses right. that we saw early in that wave that are very famously trading at lower levels. Yeah, so I, I mentioned it just as an example of the type of speculation that, that the Fed wanted to address uh, you know, in, with its tightening yeah. cycle, also the Bank of Canada and, and global central banks. 
But it also is a bit of an ask, uh, you know, related to a theme of increased regulation because they came under another level of scrutiny, uh, you know, at, at the SEC and other places. And I think that's also affected M&A activity. But overall, you have some of the anticipated effects of a tightening cycle. Yeah. But then, you know, I, I don't think any of us would underestimate the, you know, just the impact that the war in Ukraine had this year. Uh, and will continue to have going forward. Of course, we don't want to focus on that only as it pertains to the M&A outlook, but the human cost of the war has been, has been huge and, and very sad. So, um, you know, that has been a factor that, that clearly has spilled over into, into M&A uh, this year, and, and let's hope for a better geopolitical environment to, in next year. Well, it's driven a number of insecurities, right? So it's highlighted energy security as a massive issue, which, you know, will have an influence on M&A. And I think that, again, it's exacerbating some of the experiences we saw in COVID where countries tried to figure out first, how do I shore up health and safety and how do I get PPE as an example and starting to put restrictions around that. And now it's geopolitical tensions and energy security becoming an increasing issue. So it's putting ESG back in the spotlight a bit more where it's forcing people to question and you know, do we need more of a journey, understanding that this is a bit more of a transition and, and giving companies time? And I also think that it's forcing a heightened commodity environment where you're seeing companies start to benefit from that. And that's certainly had an impact that we're seeing uh, on M&A in Canada, given the importance of the energy sector. And food prices, uh, you know, very important because of fertilizer and other inputs, you know, have, have put pressure on food prices as well, which has a big effect in emerging markets. From a commodity perspective, there are certainly winners in some sectors who are trying to figure out how to manage that going forward. And so I think the instability, the look at renewable sources of energy, just trying to figure out you know, what comes next. And so certainly we've seen a lot of our energy clients you know, who, by the way, our energy and power and utility clients have been the most active participants in ESG-related transactions, whether you look at renewables or the like, right? I'd say half of the deals that they're doing in the last couple of years have had some ESG or renewable component to it. That's how they're thinking about it. What's allowing them to do that? Well, the fact is that they've generated incredible amounts of cash in this time period, and now they're able to consider some of these alternatives. I think that from an ESG perspective, it's become a normal part of the conversation as opposed to a separate highlight that you talk about. Um, and I think what we're seeing for a lot of our clients, whether it's in their normal course, but also especially from an M&A perspective, those are all items that they're considering as they're evaluating a transaction and really thinking about the broader set of constituents that are involved at their company and all the parties that are impacted. You've been listening to Strategic Alternatives, the RBC M&A podcast. Join us for part two of our 2023 Outlook series in the next episode. Until then, thank you for joining us. And if there are any topics we've discussed that you'd like more information on, please contact us directly or visit our website at www.rbccm.com. This content is based on information available at the time it was recorded and is for informational purposes only. It is not an offer to buy or sell or a solicitation, and no recommendations are implied. It is outside the scope of this communication to consider whether it is suitable for you and your financial objectives.